Hey, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist, and welcome to another COVID debunking video. I think it's fair to say that most people don't understand how vaccines are made, and that's fine. It's like how I don't really understand how this computer I'm using to make this video was made. But I don't have to know that. We have experts who know that for us and then make the computers. But if someone with a relevant doctorate degree used a bunch of fancy jargon to tell me that my computer might actually blow up on me or do something that will shock me or whatever, then I might not really know how to argue against that. And it might make me nervous to use this model of computer. Similarly, some people who want you to believe that vaccines are super scary pokey things are going to bet on you not understanding how they're made. That is exactly what YouTuber John Campbell did when he recently had a guest, a sociologist, Josh Gutzgau, on his channel to talk about how vaccines are made. Together, they try to scare you and make you concerned, but in the process, they get the facts wrong. So, before we get into what they said, here are the facts. During the Phase 3 clinical trials for Pfizer's COVID mRNA vaccine, they used a process of manufacturing the mRNA vaccine called Process 1 to make most of the vials used in the clinical trials. But they knew that if they were to get approved, they would need a manufacturing process capable of producing billions of doses, and this Process 1 would not meet that demand. So they also had a Process 2. Vials from this Process 2 did supply some of the vials used in the clinical trials. John Campbell and Josh are going to want you to believe that these processes are entirely different and make different products, and that process two was not properly tested. None of these claims are correct, but let's finish the facts before we get to what they said. In order to make an mRNA vaccine, you need a DNA template. So process one and process two mainly differ in where they get the template. In process one, the template is just a piece of DNA that is synthesized and then they make more copies of it using PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Once they have many copies of this template, they use it in what's called an in vitro transcription reaction to make the mRNA. In process two, they use what's called a plasmid DNA. Plasmids are circular pieces of DNA that can be used by bacteria. So in process two, they have bacteria make many, many copies of this plasmid, and then they use that plasmid to make the mRNA template in an in vitro transcription reaction. Drug products made using both processes were tested in side-by-side -side comparison studies to make sure that they are practically identical, do the same thing, and pass the exact same quality control standards. And all of those things were demonstrated. So with that little bit of background, let's see if John and Josh got it right. And um, you've been studying some pretty interesting things. And the first one we wanted to talk about is the, um, the different processes that were used in the production of the Pfizer vaccine. The clinical trial that Pfizer BioNTech ran on their COVID vaccine, they used uh, vaccine doses that were made with one manufacturing process, what you refer to as process one. But what was given to the public after the trial uh, was not the same type of doses. They, instead, they used a different manufacturing process, an upscale manufacturing process. They call it process two. Mostly right, but again, both processes were compared in head-to-head -head studies, and they were shown to be equivalent. Here's some data showing that. The mRNA secondary structure was analyzed using techniques like circular dichroism, the sequence was determined, and the protein products that the mRNA makes were also determined, and they were found to be extremely similar, if not identical. After that point, what they need to do is they have the plasmid DNA and they have the bacteria still in that goo. And they need to clean that out and purify it. And that's where they've seemed to have done a terrible job. It's not goo. And isolating plasmids from a bacterial cell culture is so easy an undergraduate could do it. You see, after the bacteria grow and produce the plasmid, the plasmid is separated from the bacteria and collected as its own product before it's used in the in vitro transcription process. But is he correct that they seem to have done a bad job at separating the plasmid from the bacteria? No. And we can look at the data. You see, one of the quality control tests that every single batch of COVID vaccine had to go through was endotoxin testing. Endotoxins are just a part of the bacterial cell membrane that can be quite immunogenic if injected and cause some pretty bad reactions. So, Every single drug, 
not just COVID mRNA vaccines that get injected, have to be tested for endotoxins. And in this case, if we look at the head-to-head -head results of process 1 versus process 2, both processes yielded below detectable limits of endotoxin units, or EU. Another test along these lines is a colony-forming units, or CFU test, and zero colony-forming units were found in any drug product. In other words, no live bacteria were there. But Josh then goes on to lie about this and says that there were significant differences between process 1 and process 2. Again, look at the data. There is not. Trial process 2 sounds a bit more like making beer to me. <laughs> um, you, uh, you, you push it, put it all in some big vat instead of using yeast, though you use bacterium. This is just one of those irresponsible moments from John Campbell. I find it really hard to believe he has never heard of bacteria producing drugs. E. coli, the very same bacteria used in COVID vaccine manufacturing, are used to produce 30% of all approved therapeutic protein drugs. This includes insulin, which keeps diabetics all over the world alive every single day. It is produced directly from bacteria and then purified from bacteria. Manufacturers have known how to do this for decades and have been doing it safely for decades. About that later, how that might be linked to some of the some of the uh, adverse events that came up and have been, um, you know, uh, written up in the mainstream academic press that we didn't see hardly at all. In Another really dishonest statement from Josh there. There is absolutely no evidence that this change in manufacturing, which again produces the exact same product that passes the exact same quality control standards, has any increase in adverse events. He's right that there are adverse events post-rollout that we hardly saw, if at all, in the clinical trials, but that's because these adverse events are extremely rare. Phase 3 clinical trials consist of about 30 to 40,000 people when it comes to the COVID vaccine clinical trials. Those 30 to 40,000 people are split up into a placebo and a treatment group. So if an adverse event is 1 in 50,000, 1 in 100,000, 1 in a million, you're not going to get a statistically significant signal that that adverse event is actually caused by the vaccine in the clinical trials. That's why vaccines and any drug really are intensely monitored in their rollout period. This is also called phase four study. This is where rates of adverse events are closely monitored and compared to background known rates of this adverse event. And if it increases amongst people who are taking the drug or the vaccine, then it's a safety signal that can be investigated further. It has nothing to do with manufacturing processes. Let me give an example of how illogical this scare tactic that they're using here is. If I grow tomatoes outside my garden using nothing but water and dirt, then you're probably not going to have much of an issue eating them, right? But then suddenly, if I take those tomatoes and put them in a greenhouse, or if I take them inside and grow them on my windowsill with aquaponics, and you say, wait a minute, that's a new process. We need to study this. That could be really dangerous. When in reality, you're still ending up with the same product, a tomato. If two different processes give you the exact same product, it's going to do the exact same thing and have the exact same safety profile. It's just as simple as that. I'll give you an example. Have you ever heard of the cutter incident? No, please tell me. You know, I'm glad Josh brought this up. The cutter incident actually makes a really good point here. The cutter incident happened in 1955 following the approval of the polio vaccine. These polio vaccines are inactivated polio vaccines, meaning they contain whole viruses that have been killed or inactivated in a chemical process. The Cutter incident is a situation where one company, Cutter Laboratories, produced polio vaccine lots that were not properly inactivated. These vaccines went out and actually tragically did cause polio in some children. It was a mistake that our regulatory system was not equipped to catch. But one of the fallout events from the Cutter incident was a sharp tightening of regulatory standards for drug production so that something like this couldn't happen again in the future. Those are the bare bones facts of this incident, but let's see how he butchers it and uses it to his own agenda. Jonas Salk, you know, created this polio vaccine. They ran a, a trial on about 2 million children. It was very successful. And so then they turned it over to a few different labs and they said, okay, well now we need to, to make a bunch of this stuff. But they didn't provide them with the precise directions on how to exactly replicate Salk's process. And so what happened that in the cutter 
laboratory, they were making vaccines that have live polio virus. And when they injected them into kids, they got polio. There were over 200,000 kids who got a short-lived polio. He's making my son cry with this butchering of history. Cutter Laboratories and all manufacturing laboratories did receive explicit instructions on how to make a safe vaccine. That's why most labs didn't have a problem making the polio vaccine, but Cutter Laboratories did. And it's because they didn't follow those specific instructions. And regulatory bodies did not require manufacturing companies to follow those instructions step by step. That's why regulatory bodies tightened their requirements of manufacturing companies, like I mentioned earlier. Conspiracy theory, this is not anti-vax mythology. You know, this is this is accepted history. It's history that you're wildly incorrect about and misrepresenting to support your own conspiracy theory, Josh. And don't try to paint yourself as not a conspiracy theorist because you talk like this. Incident, and this there was a book written by one of the, you know, high priests of vaccinology in the U.S., Paul Offit, on this topic. Yeah, I actually have that book, The Cutter Incident by Paul Offit. And if you start reading from about page 105, you'll get an accurate retelling of what actually happened with Cutter Laboratories and what went wrong, instead of listening to Josh, where you won't learn anything and you'll be lied to. And one of the key lessons that was learned uh, from that is, yeah, when you're dealing with something complicated like a vaccine, the, a biological drug, you need to be very precise about the method. And once you change the method, you change the product. And you can't just assume that it's going to have the same effect uh, on people. So you need to do another uh, clinical trial on your new product. It's not the same. Yes, I agree, Josh. You have to be very precise with manufacturing of biologics. That's why the FDA and manufacturing companies have tons of regulations called good manufacturing procedures, good documenting procedures, good lab procedures that all have to be followed very, very closely in order for these batches to pass inspection and to get approved in the first place. Is it a perfect system? No, of course not. But you haven't shown any evidence that this change in manufacturing processes led to any adverse outcomes and produced a different product. In fact, all the evidence says the opposite. And that's always what it comes down to. At the end of the day, anti-vaxxers just don't have the evidence. But John Campbell doesn't care. As long as it makes his channel money by bringing in hundreds of thousands of views per video, he's all good with it. Anyway, that's going to do it for this week's video. As always, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And all of the science that I talked about is going to be linked in the description below so that you can read it for yourself. And of course, if you enjoyed this, don't forget to subscribe so you can join me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then. Thank you.